Today is Chief of Staff John Kelly's last day at the White House. He recently weighed in on the Trump administration in a rare exclusive interview with the Los Angeles Times. Kelly revealed some major new details about his experience in the White House, and he opened up about President Trump's border wall, the administration's zero tolerance immigration policy, and the travel ban. Los Angeles Times immigration and security reporter Molly O'Toole wrote the article on Kelly's interview, and she's joining us now from San Diego. Thanks for joining us, Molly. Um, really, really fascinating article because an interview because I think a lot of us have spent time sort of trying to interpret uh, Kelly's facial expressions, his hand gestures, his his head, whether his head is down or up, and not really getting much insight from the man. So this is why this, the, 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 these articles were so great. So first off, I want to start with this. John Kelly called his job as chief of staff for the president bone crushing. What did he mean by that? I mean, he was pretty candid in the interview that the job was extremely difficult. Um, other people have reported that he has told people it, it, he has the worst job in the world or it's the most difficult job he's ever had. Uh, in their interview with me, he described really long days, uh, every waking moment spent with the president, uh, discussing the issues, arguing sometimes. Uh, um, he also described uh, really a nonstop job and very difficult. And whether it was um, handling some of these controversies uh, that came early on in, uh, in uh, the Trump administration and really have continued, um, or this sort of interagency rivalry and palace intrigue and just the, the dynamic of uh, such an inexperienced administration when it comes to government, uh, trying to manage that and, and institute some sort of process or order where there was none when he came in, at least that's how he describes it. Yeah, you know, Molly, the article uh, uh, and the title of your piece is John Kelly says his tenure as Trump's chief of staff is best measured by what the president did not do. You say uh, that oftentimes Kelly mentioned that the president uh, would press or ask questions about the limits of his authority. Uh, what more can you tell us about that? It seems very troubling for a lot of people. I think, well, there's there's a few different aspects of this. I think to some extent Kelly was sort of referring to President Trump's style. Uh, he clearly didn't have experience in, uh, in government, in foreign policy, in national security uh, when he came in. Uh, John Kelly has had a, a long uh, uh, career uh, in government or in public service in the military. Uh, so really contrasting style. So I think where, the, where he sort of described the president sort of constantly pushing the limits of what he could and could not do, it was more of why can't we do it this way or why can't we do it this way? And then having to get the team together to sort of explain, well, you know, we have to ask Congress or we have to act within uh, these constraints of the law. So I think the, the first aspect of it was uh, was certainly style. I mean, I think in terms of um, his tenure, or Kelly and his defenders uh, sort of framing his tenure as best measured by what the president didn't do or, or what he was able to prevent the president from doing. I think that really gets at the heart of uh, people's question about John Kelly, sort of what did he really believe? He was supposed to be the adult in the room managing President Trump. Uh, did he succeed in doing that? At. Um, some of the examples that we can see certainly are sort of in the America first isolationist uh, realm uh, of the Trump administration thus far. Um, obviously, the president was very explicit about his impulse to withdraw troops from Afghanistan, uh, to withdraw troops uh, from Syria, even potentially to withdraw U.S. troops from South Korea. Um, and that, that didn't happen, at least until a week after, until a week after um, John Kelly's tenure, then we end also uh, Jim Nass, around the time of Jim Mattis's re resignation. We see the announcement uh, via Twitter about withdrawing troops from Syria and half the troops from Afghanistan. So I think that's a good example, potentially, of where John Kelly, uh, excuse me, John Kelly was able to um, to sort of temper those impulses. Yeah, in your article, uh, Kelly says that, you know, he saw one of his jobs as uh, to provide uh, the president with multiple streams of detailed information in order to make a decision. And I just wondered if he expressed any frustration with providing all these streams of information. And it's been reported that the president doesn't like to read, that the president operates from his gut, as you point out in, in the article. I mean, that has to be frustrating. 
I mean, clearly, I think in him describing it as a bone-crushing job and one of the hardest jobs he's ever had and, and very long days and every moment spent with the president um, sort of navigating these issues and, and negotiating in a way, um, I think that hints at the frustration of providing all these multiple sources information uh, and sometimes the president going the other way. Clearly, it's in John Kelly's interest um, to uh, portray a process that he put in place as working. But also, John Kelly's been very clear um, he sort of has this military mindset uh, about the a chain of command and commander in chief. And so he emphasized sort of over and over that he provided all the information that he could um, from people on both sides of an issue from all across government. But when the president made a decision, he did not see it as his job um, to sort of stand in the way of that decision, but he saw it as his job to implement that decision, whether you like it or not. Uh, to implement that decision. And, you know, people can argue sort of both sides as to whether that meant that John Kelly was the best man for the job, but that's clearly how he saw the position of chief of staff. Uh, let me ask you this, Molly. Uh, you, you talk a little bit in the piece about some of the controversies that he himself, Mr. Kelly, faced. Uh, setting aside his distingu distinguished and esteemed career as a Marine commander, as a Marine general, there were a couple of things that had a lot of people scratching their heads because going into the job, there were certain uh, Americans who thought, well, he's going to be the adult in the room. But then there were other instances that indicated that he was perhaps more aligned with the president's worldview than perhaps we thought. For example, saying that the Civil War happened because of a lack of Compromise, or when he attacked Representative Frederica Wilson over uh, Maxine her support. Waters. Uh, sorry, was it Maxine Waters? Uh, I think it was Frederica okay. Wilson. He called her an empty barrel because she was very supportive of uh, the soldier's family who was killed in Niger. He also mishandled the Rob Porter situation. So I, I want to get from you what your impression was about who he actually was, what his worldview was, and how he felt about those things. He never apologized to Representative Wilson, for example. Right. I mean, I clearly I wish I could have resolved all the mysteries uh, that are John Kelly and the seeming contradictions between uh, whether some of his policy positions or certain people's perceptions of him uh, before he got into the administration. So I won't claim to have resolved all of these mysteries. But, um, you know, the only one of those scenarios that you raised um, between seeming to agree with the president and equating both sides in Charlottesville um, to the, the very uh, sort of bizarre um, and very intense uh, public uh, appearance after uh, the ambush in Niger uh, and the call that was really mishandled uh, with the widow um, and the congresswoman. Um, between all of those issues, the only one he's acknowledged publicly that he had mishandled uh, was the Rob Porter uh, situation. Um, so I think these, contra these seeming contradictions uh, very much remain. And I think even John Kelly's supporters have been surprised the degree to which he has uh, been aligned with the president on a policy issue or at least been willing uh, to give a sort of full-throated defense of the president in scenarios where uh, people thought that what the president had either said or done was really indefensible. Uh, so I think that it is clear that John Kelly's legacy, um, whatever he may have prevented the president from doing, is going to be tied up with these with these controversies, especially the ones that you mentioned, but also on policy issues uh, from the travel ban when he was Homeland Security Secretary uh, to the family separation policy. Um, even if he sort of puts the blame for those two examples in particular on the failure uh, of um, the administration to follow the process that he had tried to put in place or uh, to sort of um, follow the interagency guidelines uh, that previous administrations uh, had followed in order to get the, the best expertise before rolling out a policy as complicated and as wide sweeping as the travel ban, for example. So even if he puts the blame on uh, the administration process uh, sort of failing or people not engaging with that process, uh, his legacy is going to be very closely tied uh, with the controversies of the Trump administration. You know, right at the end of the piece, um, he talks about why he took the job in the first place and the dedication to being a military man. A military man doesn't quit. I'm wondering why he's quitting now. I think he put it in a few different ways, and, and, and this information has been reported as well, um, believing that sort of an 18-month or, or two-year, if you look at the total time of Homeland Security Secretary and also in the White House, uh, was an appropriate period of time, um, that he was always going to try and stay until 2020, uh, that after the midterms uh, was a good time. Um, but I think we can also look at the frustrations of the job. 
um, and the sort of before and after uh, Kelly and Mattis uh, news about the resignation came out and uh, for the reporting about the withdrawal of troops in Afghanistan and uh, in Syria. I think we can look at that and, and combine with Kelly's comments and see that it was both uh, timing. Um, we're approaching 2020 as well. Uh, there's been reporting that there's concerns from the administration that John Kelly was not a political uh, man, not politically inclined, and, and he was very adamant that he told the president when he took the job that he didn't think the president would be best served by someone who's overly concerned with politics. And then we see the policy differences that persisted, um, particularly, at least publicly, um, on the sort of isolationist America first um, area, foreign policy area, as I mentioned. So I think we can see all of these things combined um, and 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 uh, take away the conclusion uh, that John Kelly thought it was the right uh, the right time. Uh, just a great interview, uh, Molly O'Toole. Congratulations on getting it because it really did offer us a lot of insight into what Chief of Staff Kelly was thinking um, mm -hmm. during his tenure uh, in the White House. So thank you so much for joining us to share those insights. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me.